Hello and welcome to my channel. I am Daisy, your hostess. In this video, we are going through the book titled How to Tap Your Hidden Sources of Energy by Elmer Wheeler. If you just found us here at this video and would like to catch up with previous chapters, please visit my book playlist. And to my subscribing community, welcome back. So what did you think about the last two chapters? enthusiasm and getting things done right the first time. Those were the topics of the last chapters. And yes, if you're enthusiastic about what you're doing, then there seems to be this surplus of energy. And enthusiasm is all about enjoying what you're doing. And whenever a person is enjoying whatever they are tasked to do, well, it seldom does feel like work, doesn't it? So the secret is, if you're going to spend any amount of time doing something, make sure that it is something that you enjoy doing. And if getting paid is the end reward, then that's a win-win, not only for the you, but it's also for those that you're doing the work for. Everybody will be enriched by it. And the author also mentioned that enthusiasm excels know-how. So we have to kind of go back uh, to the author understanding that Elmer Wheeler was a top salesman. And so when we think about organizations that have like teams uh, or even, uh, you know, like sports, you can have all the knowledge about something, but if you don't have that energy, the passion and the drive and, and the joy of what you're doing, then it doesn't translate out into the field. It doesn't translate into the environment. And you do need that contagious energy that allows others to build up on that. And that's where big success comes from. Because you know what? People can learn the trade if they love what they do. And of course, uh, the other chapter was talking about conserving energy by doing things right the first time. Without going too far, you might even remember instances when your improper planning or lack of planning or, you know, just not really thinking how you were going to get from point A to point C uh, in that straight line and finding that you have to double back or double track on something. And that's just so much wasted energy. So uh, even if this is the smallest task, if you plan, you'll get more more out of your time, which then allows you to have more energy to do more of it or to do more of the other things that you like doing. All right. Well, thank you for listening to my little recap. I'm heading now to the next chapter. Chapter four, how you can banish emotional fatigue and compound your energy. He who laughs lasts. Can you determine your own plimsoll mark and so prevent a crack up? Samuel Plimsoll, who created this line or marker as seafaring men refer to it, did so scientifically. It was not guesswork. It was science. Sam didn't stand in front of a ship and after a few calculations say, put the marker there, pointing his finger somewhere around the midship. Indeed not. The Plimsoll marker is figured out by determining the cubic placement of the ship and other factors too complicated to go into, after which the line or marker is painted on. Usually, it is in the form of a circle, through the top of which runs one long white line and through the bottom another line. The bottom line is for seawater, the lower line for fresh water for the density of water affects the way the ship will sink from loading. Had enough? I can't a good psychiatrist tell a patient the point at which he is apt to crack up? In part, I am told, this can be done, for often people go in cycles and have a certain set time for a periodic nervous breakdown. This time can be determined by good medical men after considerable diagnosis and study of a patient. That is well and good. But how about you, normal people? Can you tell when you've had enough so that you can go to your lounge chair and relax instead of having to go to a doctor's couch? Research I have done has brought out some interesting things that may help a good self-analyst to determine how much stress and strain he can take. Often you have said, I just can't take any more. 
you recognize that you'd had enough. Some people realize when they're nearing their own markers, but others are unaware of the human plimsoll mark and get over their heads before they realize it. Then the trouble occurs. The following analysis of the two different forms of fatigue will help you determine your own stress and strain limits. The two forms of fatigue. Medical men tell me there are two main forms of fatigue, physical and emotional. Physical fatigue is brought on by work or play in which the muscles are involved, such as washing dishes, ironing, sweeping floors, walking to work, walking from sales office to sales office as part of your job, or in games such as golf, tennis, hunting, and even fishing. Many sports bring on physical fatigue, and the doctors say this sort of fatigue is good for one. It relaxes tension, softens the nervous energy, and makes the bed feel like a friend and not a nightly enemy with which to battle. What burns energy? Overstimulating subjects burn energy, so avoid such subject as crime of the violent kind, political subjects, radical thoughts, front page crisis, Overstimulation burns up energy of body organs and overtires a person. Exercise stirs the system, makes the blood pound faster, and often this alone keeps killer cholesterol from clogging up your pipes. Heart specialists such as Ike's famous Dr. Doodley White ask heart cases of a certain kind to move around in mild exercise, which is why Ike played so much golf and shot quail. Why Vice President Lyndon Johnson rode horses on his LBJ ranch in Texas and was active around the place. Why this fellow next door, who was suddenly taken to the hospital with a heart attack, is now out mowing the lawn. A few years ago, that chap would have been confined to his rocking chair for life. Not anymore. Doctors recognize the body is in need of exercise from work or play to keep the hormones of man alive and bubbling. The prescription of today's heart specialist, exercise in an easy way. Insomnia patients, those who bring their briefcases to bed, men wound up at night, women nervous and worried about things, all soon learn that they can't woo the Sandman. The harder you woo him, the farther he runs. But you can sneak up on him with a long walk, some physical exertion. Tired muscles instead of tired nerves make people sleep. Energy eaters. Grief, discouragement, anxiety, apprehension, fear of something or someone. On the other hand, if you want to build up a low load of energy, try these energy problems. Joy, affection, kindness, hope, helping others, agreeability. This sort of physical fatigue is to be welcomed. Meat killer fatigue. Then comes killer fatigue. Emotional fatigue, as it is called, wherein the nerves get worn to a frazzle from constant and prolonged thinking. You tap your fingers, maybe a foot. You bite your nails, scratch imaginary itches, and develop eye, arm, or shoulder tics. You are a maze of wound up nerves, all tangled, and the harder you think, the less you straighten out the nerves. And the more you fight the pillow, the less you sleep. This is emotional fatigue, EF. It's a killer diller, the kind that really sends you to Dr. Carl Menninger in Topeka or some local state rest home. It's as deadly as sin as killing as vice. For it is a sin and a vice combined, since it comes from within and not from without. Like a virus, and it is all mental and of your own doing. You wound yourself much as a cat will wind up a ball of yarn if it gets to it. When you reach the finger tapping stage, you've got EF. If you are alert, then you will know it is time to say, I've reached my plimsoll mark. I'd better change pace, job, or my pattern of life else I'll sink over my head like a ship that is overloaded with cargo. Is there a positive cure? 
How can you cure EF? In many ways, I am told, one of which is the change of pace or of daily pattern that is evidently getting you down for such reasons as boredom, fear of not getting places in life, worries over money, love, friendship. But in self-diagnosing your cure, you must search deeper than for the exact thing that cracked you up. Often you have heard, I hardly said a word to him and he exploded. True, you didn't set off the explosion. You were merely the final straw on the deck that caused the plimsoll mark to disappear below the surface. What long string of happenings led up to the blow up? Dig deep to find the circumstance. Lie on your own couch and think. Think and talk, talk. Tell yourself your life's story. See if suddenly you don't sit up and say, There, that's the hidden cause of my nerves. I am annoyed because my school friends are getting on farther and faster than I am in life. I worry about this. I get myself all riled up. I must stop and analyze my own life to see what things I have, such as health, children, a job that they haven't got. In many ways, I excel them. Even though my work is not as glamorous, even though my income is less, I am a rich man in more ways than they are. Locate the cause of your worries and you'll end EF. Two plimsoll marks. As with a ship, you will find yourself in two classifications. One, you are a saltwater person. Two, a freshwater personality. The plimsoll mark for the salt water is higher than for the fresh water since seawater is denser having salt and a ship won't sink so fast in salt water. In fact, in Great Salt Lake or the Dead Sea, it is hard to drown. On the other hand, the fresh water marker is lower on the plimsoll circle for you cannot put as much cargo in the ship in fresh water. People are the same way. One person can take more than another. How you can stand all that chatter, I don't know. She has a freshwater personality about to blow up. This person's nerves are more on edge and little things annoy him far more than his associates who can be loaded down with a far heavier cargo of troubles before they sink over their markers. Which person are you? Are you easily upset, easily annoyed? Then you are freshwater. But if the mortgage doesn't bother you and you have no fears of failure in life and you have a good old Irish I don't give a damn attitude, then you may hold more cargo for you are a saltwater personality. It is difficult to sink you. Although you do have your marker beyond which you must not go else, Dr. Menninger will be greeting you at his front gate one of these days. Can pills cure you? How about pills? Will they cure me of EF? I cannot answer. I am no medical man, just a student of human going on. I know that certain tranquilizers help nerves. I have heard that other pills build up nervous energy, but I believe the day of nerve tonics has passed along with nostrums and snake oil. One sure cure is a sense of humor. You should see humor in certain serious situations. I should have stood in bed today, laughs the seesaw Brooklyn man as worry after worry pops up on him. Suddenly he sits back and laughs at himself. Hell, I'm off to the movies before I bust up. He slams the desk drawer, grabs his hat, and is off to save himself from Menninger. He knows instinctively where his plimsoll marker lies. He keeps above it. No, Virginia, there's no magic pill. But there is a magic cure for nerves, and that's a sense of humor. On a recent trip, I met Batoja, a hotel impresario with a residence in Rome. We sat in his Hotel Mediterraneo as I put this question to him. Why are Italians so alive, alert, gay, and happy? What secret do you have that we Americans don't know about? The reason you Americans get so tired, he told me, is you race through a meal, talking, talking, talking. You shove food down your mouth as you discuss some big business proposition that simply can't wait for another hour. That tears your nervous system, makes you jittery. Each time I go to one of your fast service restaurants, I come out a nervous wreck. Then Batoja told me how to quiet down in true Roman style. How to dine is pleasure, not to eat. 
but dying. There is a difference, he said. I saw there was. I began to relax, to settle back in my chair, sipping the coffee and smoking the cigar offered me. Mine is the rule of the four C's of contentment, said Batoja. The rule of four C's. What are the four C's of contentment? I asked, caring little if he told me, for I was really tranquilized by the surroundings, food, wine, and the music. C for coffee, C for cognac, C for cigars. And the fourth C? Ah, yes, the last C. The C for companionship. I suddenly realized why Italians are gay, friendly, and happy people most of the time are not habitués of couch docks and have little need for sanitariums. To be sure, they are excitable at times, but as you watch them saunter down the Via Veneto or amble up the Spanish steps in Rome, you will see people who have few nervous tics in eyes or shoulders. Instead, they may have a guitar. When I worry, I strum a guitar, said Batoja. Only I can't play, but I still strum. That's Rome, I told him. I was reciting his own favorite expression. That's Rome. Three Steps to Energy You can well summarize this chapter in three steps. Step one, learn to recognize your own limit, your plimsoll mark. Step two, have a sense of humor, for it relaxes you. Step three, take time to be leisurely. If you will do these three steps, you will banish EF. Chapter Success Story Marjorie Devlin was severely injured in an automobile accident, and this resulted not only in handicap of physical movement, but it sent her into emotional fatigue. EF kept her down more than her crippled condition. Then one day, she contacted by telephone many of her former bosses and offered to do spare time typing for them. The idea gave her a lift. She had something to keep boredom away. The bosses liked the idea of a spare secretary and responded. Marjorie became a new person, alive with pep and vigor. Soon she had more work than she could handle, so farmed it out and it was not too long before she had a placement service for secretaries. Today, she still has her physical handicap, but certainly not an emotional handicap. She has a staff of typists and secretaries to handle, as well as needing three typists herself to put on paper what her active mind develops. You see that you can transfer physical handicaps into emotional strength rather than fatigue by finding something to keep your mind active. And then backing it up with enthusiasm, the greatest of all motivators and killers of the tiredness virus. Learn the art of keeping busy, for activity generates energy. Chapter Thought Emotional fatigue is a killer diller. When you are wound up, you are bound up. Locate the causes of your EF and you'll be on the road to energy, pep, vim, and vigor. Eight Tricks to save your strength. 1. Read a detective story instead of the stock report. 2. Put your legs on the cocktail table, not your brain. 3. Live life and love life. 4. Stand a moment in front of a plate glass window and admire your reflection instead of rushing by in a big sweat. 5. Don't keep a heavy foot on the gas pedal. You won't be ahead of the others except by a block or two. 6. Stop and chat with people. Don't rush by them. 7. Forget to worry. 8. Don't point accusing fingers. Fold your arms instead and you'll last longer. A big secret for longevity from Pat, my gardener. When I works, I works hard. When I sits, I sits loose. But when I starts to worry, I goes to sleep. 10 ways to avoid emotional fatigue. 1. 
Don't nervously twiddle your fingers. Two, quit tapping your foot. Three, twice a day, forget to worry. Four, don't procrastinate, it worries you. Five, stop being a chain smoker. Six, quit pacing up and down the floor. Seven, stop biting your fingernails. Eight, don't fiddle with your ears. Nine, avoid nervously combing hair all day. Ten, don't chew your pipe stem or cigar. End of chapter. Please do pardon. There will be some background noise. I can't stop that. My neighbor's dogs are barking and there's mowing happening in people's yards. So for that, I do apologize. I don't have a professional studio. I'm going to continue on to the next chapter. If you could take a second or so, hit that like button. Relax as I flip the page to chapter five. How an inferiority complex saps your energy and what you can do about it. All fearfulness is folly. Many factors drain off energy and leave one limp. And one of the greatest siphons of energy is an inferiority complex. At first thought, this seems impossible. How can an inferiority complex run down a tank full of physical energy? Yet it does as anyone with an inferiority complex will tell you. The shy guy sits alone with his thoughts. He burns up energy fuming about why he isn't a success because all around him, he sees success. You might think the chap dancing all night burns up energy, but while he is using physical energy, the shy guy in the corner burns up emotional energy. The dancer flops into bed like a football player after a game and is sound asleep while the guy lies down, untired physically, but so worn out mentally that he is wide awake all night long. Fear causes energy loss. What then creates an inferiority complex that acid eats energy? It has often been proved that fear of yourself is the greatest cause. You fear you are not important in the world and you shy into corners. You may have been born on the wrong side of what you thought was the right side of the railroad tracks and so mope about until you have a walloping case of the inferiorities. Yet if you got determined, as did Elsa Maxwell, you'd win out. Elsa was self-pitying and was never invited to parties until she got mad and determined that she'd become the world's leading party giver by turning an inferior complex into a superior one. Today, she is master of her complexes and world's greatest party giver to kings and queens. No longer is Elsa Maxwell a defeat each night, flopping on her couch in exhaustion. Parties keep her alive. They stimulate her. She stays up half the night, yet has reserve energy, for it is self-created energy from doing what she feels now is superior to other things, and that is the big trick. Do what you are best in, and you will have energy to burn. Fears can come true. People with fears often make them come true. Doctors without fear of germs can work for years in contagious wards and seldom catch that disease. Their willpower seems to forestall the disease. On the other hand, athletes fearing colds seem to catch them. It has been found that many athletes with such fears have four colds a year, then after graduating have just one cold per year. Banish fear. That's a big secret to beat failure. The Bulls Fighter Story the late Juan Belmonte, often called world's greatest bullfighter, had an inferiority complex that bound him up in knots of tension. Fear of himself tore him apart. He'd lie nights and tremble at his weakness, his short legs. He was not a handsome man and rather weak-kneed and this injured his pride, which in turn upset him emotionally and brought on mental exhaustion. He was always tired, pepless and lacked vigor. Then, determination took over. He did almost the impossible. Sure, suicide for one with wobbly legs, he became a bullfighter. 
Now at first, that sounds as silly as Elsa Maxwell, never invited to a party as a child, becoming a world party giver, yet Juan Belamonte did the foolish, the impossible, and became the number one bullfighter because his weakness taught him a great lesson in fighting bulls. Not to leap from in front of the bull, but to lead him around you. That Belmonte technique caught on and started the present technique used in all bull rings, where the handsome bullfighters would step back, often leap back, as the bull charged. Belmonte was unable to. His legs couldn't function that fast, so he developed cape techniques to guide the bull around him. The spectators shouted, Bravo! They tossed their hats and flowers to the little fellow and gave him tails of bulls and ears and hoofs and carried Mr. Inferiority Complex around on their shoulders. But now he was no longer inferior. He was great, the greatest of them all. The lesson? Often you can turn your weakness into your very strongest point and win with energy to spare. The Arthur Murray Story now, you may not have been angered as were Elsa and Juan at your early life handicap when most inferiority complex blossom, yet you should get angry. For in bursting out with anger at your weakness, you build up determination. And that's as good as having energy, for determination creates energy. Try getting madder, then madder, until finally you have built up a great atomic store of determination, and soon you will excel. You'd never believe it today when you see him on a TV program or in one of his studios dancing with pretty gals. But at one time, Arthur Murray was shoved into the stag line of life. No one wanted to dance with the thin little guy sitting shyly in a corner, biting his nails and developing a whopper of a case of nerves, tension, and fears of his success in life. Then Arthur got mad. He got madder. Well, Look around your city for the answer. You'll see it on signs that read Arthur Murray Dance Studios. The man is still only a wisp of a person, yet he has the energy of an atlas. And that brings up still another story. It is that of a weakling. He couldn't mow the lawn without falling into a slump from lag of energy. He needed long hours of daily rest to rejuvenate him from the most humble of daily chores. He was truly the weakling of the flock. Then he got mad at his puny body. He got determined. He set up a program of proper eating and proper exercise to develop himself. Have you guessed who he turned out to be? It is none other than Charles Atlas, the strong man. So you see, there is hope for yourself. If you are shy and bashful and have a soul-disturbing inferiority complex that is robbing you of daily vigor, face yourself in the mirror. Then set a target, aim yourself at it, and you'll succeed. Six good shyness tests. How do you know if you have an unnerving complex? Here are sure signs. Being the last to queue up on a line. Last to raise your hand in question. Sit in last rows at meetings. Always walking behind people. Blushing easily and often breaking out in a sweat when talking to others. There are many other such giveaway signs, and if you have any, then you know your body must be burning up needless energy to keep you going, and you lack the fighter's energy and need to do something about it, as did Juan and Elsa and Arthur and Charles. But you know you can do it, for you were born with the same chance in life as these people. Who are extroverts? It has often been observed that a so-called extrovert is none other than an introvert in disguise trying to exert himself. Keen observers know a true extrovert from a pseudo-extrovert when trying to overcome his bashfulness through conversation, through wearing a red necktie and loud clothes. The true extrovert was born with hepped up glands, all functional at great speed. He is so-called born leader, yet leaders are not born. Theodore Roosevelt was so weak as a child that he had to be sent out west to gain strength. His determination was great. He souped up his glands through proper diet and outdoor living and ended up leading an army up in San Juan Hill. 
So you see, you don't need to be born a leader. You can make one of yourself by determination to overcome a weak body. Fear is to be feared. You fear as a child that you can't get good grades, can't keep up and play with others. This fear keeps you run down emotionally and it reflects in a run down body. The trick is to sell yourself that your fear is groundless and to set about an improvement plan to help you up. Fear of being laughed at tears the souls of people. That is why patent medicine advertisements catch the eyes of puny men and they run for the nostrum. One of the most successful ads read along this line. They laughed when I sat down to play the piano, but people responded. They took private lessons. Then came the day they sat down at the party, and before you could say Cobb Calloway, they were the life of the party. Their fears petered out and they gained confidence, and with this they gained energy. The person who used to leave parties early because he lacked stamina to continue now plays the piano far into the night, and people say, what energy? How did he suddenly get it? He got it through a determination to be the life of the party. Now, the enthusiasm and praise of others keeps his energy going full blast and he no longer reads pet pill advertisements. We are all ignoramuses. One sure cure for an inferiority complex is to know we are all ignorant of many subjects. None of us is an all-around egghead and the sooner we realize this, the quicker we overcome an inferiority feeling. You feel inferior when a bookkeeper finds errors in your statement. This drains your enthusiasm and you become pepless. That is, unless you realize that you excel the bookkeeper in many other things, then you feel better. So look around for your excellences and play them up. Turn the bookkeeping over to the bookkeeper. Realize he is good and you are bad. But then turn on your good qualities and gain the admiration of the bookkeeper and you'll feel better and have a sudden surge of energy bounding through your system. Everywhere in your daily work, you excel others. All over the home, you excel. Perhaps you can't type, but you can hire typists. Perhaps you can't bake a cake. You can buy one. Don't go against the stream. Flow with it. This is the trick the swimmer uses to conserve energy and one you can do swimming through life. Float when necessary, then swim hard where you know you excel. The trick? Know wherein you excel all others. Planned loafing. One way to conserve energy is to plan. You can plan work, pleasures, and retirement. People who plan vacations or retirement are never shocked by sudden disappointment, for possible defeats are part of their planning. A person who suddenly inherits wealth doesn't know what to do about it. The person suddenly out of a job or who is retired and who has made no plans is a lost soul. Planners always know how to get things done. Four success steps. Charlie Goodyear had an inferiority complex from lack of education. It drove him into corners where he sulked and ate out his soul as eggheads pranced around until one day, by accident, he dropped rubber on a stove and his alert brain conceived the technique of vulcanizing. Now his name is on building all over Akron, Ohio, and people remark, man, what energy that fellow has. I wonder what he eats. A fellow named O'Sullivan found his energy going lower and lower each day as he worked. One day, he put a rubber matting under his feet and this softened the constant shocks of feet against concrete. His energy revived. He was less tired at night. Then he decided others could have the same energy-saving benefit, and today most of us wear rubber heels to prevent pounding pavements from wearing us down. Recognize the following, and you'll gain energy by overcoming the great robber, the inferiority complex. 1. That we excel others in many ways. 2. That determination whips any complex. 3. That praise from others stimulates our energy. 4. That an inferiority complex can be overcome. 
If you will realize these things, there's no reason why you should any longer sit in the shy guy's corner of life. You will go out on the front porch of your life and show the world, like Elsa and Juan and Arthur and Atlas and Charlie and O'Sullivan. What they can do, you can do better in gaining energy, the greatest of all motivators in life. Chapter Success Story Otto Diefenbach didn't come from Harvard, Yale, or Princeton, as did so many of our presidents. Yet, he did something educational in life that no president could boast of having accomplished. Otto was shy. He had a great case of worries that burned up his energies. He had a magnificent inferiority complex, because of which he'd sit and nervously wind and unwind the cellophane around the innumerable packages of cigarettes he smoked. He had a habit of tossing the cellophane on the floor, then start winding up more cellophane. But he had one enthusiasm that fear didn't burn up or worry destroy. It was a precious ingredient anyone can have. He was observant. He observed one day that the cellophane he rolled up and tossed aside stayed rolled up. His brain suddenly clicked. I have a great idea, he exclaimed. Then he perfected the idea. He took his daydream to Dupont, and today every child in America is thankful to Otto, for he gave them cellophane straws to sop up chocolate sodas. Now that's a man I called educated. Chapter Thought a surefire rule to overcome worry and fear. Read a newspaper only once a week and be glad all the daily portents and dangers are already over with. Nine ways to overcome an inferiority complex and gain energy. One, be a regular guy. Regularity conserves energy. Two, candles have only one end to burn. Burn just it. Three, Walk, don't run in fear. Four, smile. Don't frown in worry. Five, wash shy thoughts from your mind. Six, sit in the middle of things, not on sidelines. Seven, enthuse. For enthusiasm kills complexes and builds energy. Eight, get mad. Then matter until you get determination. 9. Play up your excellences. Play down your weaknesses. End of chapter. Meet me at the next video where we continue with the book titled How to Tap Your Hidden Sources of Energy by Elmer Wheeler.